Okay. Hello guys. Today This video was. I know everybody watched these videos, but I want to react to it again. Cause why not? I, have I recently I made the mistake of playing League of Legends at 4 a.m. You see, I couldn't sleep, likely due to being overstimulated from the 12 straight hours of playing this piss pit of a game. Through it. Let's have a war. Everyone yeah, knew a big a war, war was coming. France wanted some stuff back that Germany had taken from it. Germany wanted to take more of everyone's stuff, and they were building a big sexy navy that was making the oh British uncomfortable. God. These two empires thought they were really cool, but lots of different people who lived there didn't think it was so cool. And some of them had even been declaring independence with help from Russia. Everyone was talking about each other behind each other's backs, knowing the fact that military technology had come a long way since the last major war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up. In this area of Austria-Hungary live some Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand goes there for a nice drive in an open-top car with his car seat published in advance. And that went just about as well as you'd expect. Some assassins were waiting for him along the way and threw bombs at his car. But they missed and blew up some officers behind him. Yeah, they blew up the so the Archduke officers. goes into hiding, right? leaves Sarajevo, and the whole war never happens. Except no, the Archduke doesn't leave, but instead goes back out in the open top car to visit the injured officers in hospital. The driver takes a wrong turn and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside one of the failed assassins. Who shoots him? Austria-Hungary is understandably pissed about all this, and they think the Serbian government had something to do with it, which they might have. So they go to their ally Germany and say, Hey Germany, we're gonna declare war on Serbia, and Germany is all for that. So Austria-Hungary send a big list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refuses, they declare war. Austria-Hungary and Germany are friends, and Serbia is protected by Russia who's friends with France, so they all declare war on each other. Montenegro joins in too. France and Britain also have a kind of alliance. So when France says, Hey Britain, you got my back? Britain is like, Maybe. And then they decide to stay out of it, which is great for Germany, because Germany has a plan. They know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to get ready for war. So with this guy in charge, Germany will send all its troops into France at lightning speed while Russia is getting ready. Defeat France, then move all the troops to Russia and defeat Russia, and then we all speak German and eat Pfeffer Potast every day. Just one problem. France has loads of forts and defenses along its German border, and Germany can't waste any time fighting them, so Germany decides to go around them. Belgium. Belgium is neutral, but Germany wants to march 750,000 troops through it to get around France's defenses. They're hoping Belgium will just kind of sit down and shut up, but they don't. They fight back, and they're pretty good too, so they slow the Germans down. What's worse is that Britain shows up, and they're pretty pissed that Germany's invading neutral countries. So now Britain declares war in Germany. So Germany push on through Belgium and commit some atrocities along the way. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniform. So if you're trying to not look like the bad guys, good job. The Allies have a propaganda extravaganza, and this starts having an influence around the world, notably in America. The US President Woodrow Wilson sees himself as a bit of a Jesus figure, and spends most of the war trying to get everyone to just hug it out. But there's also a large population of ethnic Germans living in the United States, and when the war first broke out, they were like, yay Germany. 
But now that they're committing atrocities in Belgium, they're less enthusiastic. Let's play Spot the French Soldier. There he goes, there he is. Did you see him? Easy, right? He's wearing a bright blue uniform with red trousers. The Germans. So when the French are swimming in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily All the new soldiers in this war went in with an old school war mentality. Oh, si te voy a ver las cosas que tenemos. Update the uniforms and tactics. No sé cómo se llama. El panadero. Anyone had ever seen before. Russia is ready for war and way earlier than expected. Hey, Austria, hungry? Can you get on top of that? Oh, yeah, sure, we've got this. So Germany has to send some troops back to the east to defend against the Russians. The chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army is this guy, and although he is handsome, he turns out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignores Germany's advice, and then comes running back to Germany to get in trouble. Austria-Hungary even gets its ass kicked by tiny Serbia, who repels all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. It's better news for Germany in the north, though, where they almost completely wipe out the Russian second army. Back on the western front, the Germans continue to invade the north side of Paris. At this point, anyone would be forgiven for thinking the Germans were going to get that quick victory after all. But then things start to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done, and he ordered his armies to stop retreating. In the resulting battle, the gap opened up in the German lines. If a gap opens up, the enemy can use it to flank it from the side and behind, so the German armies have to retreat. The Allies launch a counterattack, so the Germans get into defensive positions. The Allies do the same. Then both sides trench move north, battles! trying to outflank each other along the way. When they reach the sea, they're in a stalemate with trench systems running the whole way from the coast to Switzerland. The beginning of trench warfare on the western front. Here's how it Two opposing lines of trenches with no man's land in between. One side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days at a time. But this had a huge psychological effect on the soldiers, leaving many shell-shocked. Then, the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land. A muddy wet mass of shell craters and barbed wire. The defending trench would unleash machine gun fire on the attackers, inflicting thousands of casualties. The attackers would send wave after wave until either they gave up or the opposing trench was finally overrun. There would be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands in order to gain a few meters or kilometers of land. Living in the trenches was hard work too. Corpses, mud that could swallow you whole, pools of poisonous water, rats, disease, the smell. It's insane that millions of soldiers put up with these conditions and commanders ordered them to do so for years. I know, right? Click here. Oh, okay, whatever. I want to have some fun real quick. I'm going to shoot that guy from far away nope. real what quick. Is... I'm going to shoot him from far away real nope. quick. And I'm... <laughs> Stuck in a hard stalemate. They knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory, but about simply wearing each other down. The Allies had plenty of men to expend from its overseas dominion, and the British also started a naval blockade, so Germany couldn't import stuff like food. Neither side really wanted a long, grueling war, though, so they both thought of ways to break the deadlock on the Western Front. Idea number one: New Frontiers. When the war first broke out, Australia was quick to take German New Guinea. The Allies also quickly jumped on Germany's colonies in Africa, and particularly in German East Africa, locals were enlisted as soldiers and carriers by both sides, leading to a tragic loss of life for the native Africans. Some new combatants entered the war as well. The Allies' new friends were Italy and Japan. Japan was busy building itself an empire, so it was more than happy to take away German islands and colonies in East Asia. Italy actually had an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but after some tense relations, and then the Allies promising to give them some of Austria-Hungary's stuff, they switched sides. Italy opened up a front in the mountains here, but like everyone else, they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. The Central Powers' new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. The Ottomans... The Ottoman were divided on whether to actually join the war or not, since they had been exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Some of the politicians who did want to join went off on their own and fired some shells at Russia and then came back and said, whoops, looks like we're at war now. The Ottoman entry into the war was of particular concern to the British, since the Middle East was full of oil, and Britain wanted all of that oil. First, the Ottomans tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains, but they weren't prepared for the cold, and many of them froze to death. Then they crossed miles of desert to take the Suez Canal from the British, but that failed too. 
Then the Allies tried to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench warfare campaign, but that also failed. Wait, that's the Ottomans my last blamed name. their initial Wait, losses I mean, on the ethnic like, Armenians living name. within Ottoman territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million people. Then the Germans sent spies into Afghanistan to try to convince the Arab tribes there to rise up in jihad against the British and attack India. But that plan failed, partly because the spies got bored, brewed their own alcohol, and got drunk, which is a bad thing to do in Afghanistan. All these new frontiers hadn't done much to change the war. Aware that the Allies had more men and supplies than them, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Before the war, there was a big conference that set out the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, no killing civilians. Basically, don't be jerks. The Germans held a meeting and decided to be jerks. Zeppelin air raids commenced over British cities. They also started attacking the Allied trenches with chlorine gas, and they used submarines to sink civilian ships. One such civilian ship was the Lusitania, which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk, further swaying U.S. opinion against the Germans. Not to be completely unfair to the Germans, the Allies also engaged in chemical warfare soon after, and they had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which let the Germans justify their attacks. Meanwhile, Austria-Hungary still hadn't dealt with Serbia, so the Central Powers enlisted some help. Bulgaria wished it was bigger, and was still bitter about losing the Second Balkan War. The Central Powers promised to make all of Bulgaria's wildest dreams come true if they helped, so they signed on, and together they knocked out Serbia. Bruh. The Serbian troops retreated through Albania, which was neutral but had some ties to Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary entered Albania in a friendly invasion to chase down the Serbians, many of whom escaped by sea. It's 1916, and a lot is happening. As if they didn't have enough enemies already, Germany added one more to the list. Portugal had been getting a bit chummy with the Allies behind the scenes, and Germany didn't like that one bit. Around the same time, the only sea battle of the war happened. Both sides had a new powerful class of battleships called Dreadnoughts, but they were so expensive oh, to build no. that neither side wanted to risk losing them in a battle. So they kept them in port, except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got damaged, so they didn't try that again. The UK started conscripting men to the army, so they had plenty of reserves, which is just as well because the Western Front was about to get brutal. The longest and one of the bloodiest battles of the war started when the Germans launched an attack around the French city of Verdun. The French defended it desperately, leading to hundreds of thousands of casualties. Under pressure, the French called on its allies to do something to draw the Germans' attention away. So the British started their own long and brutal fight, the Battle of the Somme, with 60,000 British casualties on just the first day. It was also here that the British first used one crazy brand new piece of sci-fi technology. The Russians had been getting pushed back further and further into their own territory, but in response to the French call for help, they began a huge offensive, and did really well until they ran out of supplies and got stuck. Seeing how well the Russians had been doing, Romania decided now would be a great time to jump in and win the war, and then they got pounded. The Greeks were fighting amongst themselves about whether to join the war or not. The king liked the Central Powers, while the Prime Minister wanted to join the Allies. After a brief national schism, during which the country split into two, the king finally abdicated and the country reunited. With Allied help, they began a new offensive. In the Middle East, Russia was pushing into Ottoman territory from the north. The British had also made a landing in Mesopotamia to protect Persia's oil fields, and they had also sent a small army up the Tigris River to try to take Baghdad. But the army got sieged in the town of Kut along the way, and eventually surrendered. A new offensive was launched from the south with all-out desert warfare. The offensive was aided by one famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped lead the Arab tribes in a revolt that wreaked havoc on the Ottoman supply line. By the time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. There were mutinies in the French army, the German populace was starving, and the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. There was no clear winner, and it was still anyone's war. The only question now was, who was going to break first? What? And the answer was Russia. Tired of not eating, and mad that a crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots, there was an uprising in Petrograd complete with riots and strikes. The riots turned into a full-scale revolution, and a new government overthrew the Tsar. And a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government, and they pulled Russia out of the war. This was great news for Germany, who now only had to focus on the Western Front. But there was still one problem. The pesky United States of America was looking increasingly like it was going to join the war. America had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war and was getting super rich off the back, meaning it was in fantastic shape and was dangerous to the Germans. So Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be crazy cool if you guys attacked America? But the British intercepted the message, showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. American troops began shipping out to Europe. This was terrible news for Germany. They knew their only hope now was to force France and the UK to surrender before the fresh American troops arrived. It was now or never, so they started one final attack. 
they converged their troops and hit hard at the Somme and pushed the Allies back. They hit a second time further north, then again and again. With each oh hit, God. the Germans were spending more and more resources, while the Allies were getting better and better at repelling their attacks. By the fifth punch, the Allies held the line and even pushed back. With American troops now arriving in larger numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, and that was it. The Central Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire, then Austria-Hungary, and finally on November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. At the peace treaty, Germany was forced to reduce its military, accept war guilt, and pay the bill for the war. After indescribable suffering and millions dead, the world learnt its lesson and never had such an awful war again for about 20 years. In 1936, a brilliant Polish doctor discovered what she believed to be the biggest biblical breakthrough of the last 2,000 years. A secret that, if rumors were true, could heal soldiers from serious wounds, make them think faster, fight off disease, and stay healthy under stressful circumstances, and by removing pain and discomfort, make them virtually invincible in battle. It's no wonder that Dr. Bennett's apparent biblical discovery caught the eye of a very evil man. You see, Adolf Hitler knew war was coming, and he was hungry for any advantage that he could get his hands on. Which, by the way, is the real reason Hitler spent years searching for lost relics, including the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, and recently declassified reports revealed that in 1939, through his vast spy network, Hitler became aware of Dr. Bennett's discovery. Within a few months of hearing about her research, he had invaded Poland and World War II had begun. Click the button you see now to discover the secret that Hitler so desperately tried to get his hands on. Now, after the outbreak of World War II, the Gestapo frantically searched for the young doctor, believing she possessed knowledge that could help Hitler win the war. But critics in Hitler's inner circle believed he had a more personal reason for going after Bennett, because they were privy to his most closely guarded secret. Hitler had a debilitating autoimmune disease, and he must have wondered if the doctor's biblical discovery truly could have the power to eliminate pain, to heal and even slow the natural aging process. This video was made possible by Skillshare. Churchill was a man with many talents. He was an artist, a butterfly enthusiast, and he had an unpublished manuscript about aliens. Clearly, he was a man with an insatiable thirst for knowledge. Maybe he could have loaded up his computer and logged onto Skillshare an online learning community with more than 19,000 classes in design, business, technology, and more. Perhaps he was considering a side career in fashion, but didn't know where to start. On Skillshare, he would find courses in fashion design and garment construction. Or if he wanted to learn app design, improve his photography, or just how to make a really good quesadilla, he would have found courses for all of these and more on Skillshare. Skillshare gives you access to high-quality classes taught by genuine experts working in their field. I work heavily with animation, and I was genuinely blown away by the number of really useful courses available to me. Like this class full of tips and tricks for creating vector art, or this one for creating character walk cycles. For an annual subscription, Skillshare is under $10 a month. And if you'd like to try it out first, then I've got a deal just for oversimplified viewers. The first 1,000 people to use this link, which can be found in the description, will get their first two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. Daniel. Be sure to try it out using the link in the description and learn something new today. Now, without further ado, when do you want to collab? it's 1902. A young man by the name of Benito Mussolini moves from Italy to Switzerland to avoid military service. He gets big into socialism, working for trade unions, writing for socialist newspapers, advocating a violent overthrow of European monarchies, the whole sh I am trying. I'm watching Oversimplified. I'm, I'm watching Oversimplified. Shebang. This gets him in a bit of trouble with the Swiss police, so he gets arrested, sent back to Italy, set free, returns to Switzerland, is arrested again, goes back to Italy again, completes his military service after previously avoiding it, and then after a brief stint as an elementary school teacher, he finally returns to work as an avid socialist. His speeches and journalistic abilities made him famous among Italian socialists. He was anti-war, so when Italy colonized Libya in 1910, he rioted and got arrested. Then World War I came along, and once again he protested Italy's involvement. But then he thought, wait a minute, this war could bring about the social climate needed to overthrow European monarchies and bring about the socialist revolution everywhere. And suddenly he was pro-war. But his fellow socialists didn't like his new pro-war stance, so they kicked him out of the party. So then he said, you know what? I'm done with socialism. We need something new, not based on class divisions tearing us apart, but based on unity through nationality. We'll conquer the Mediterranean and reunite all Italian people just like the days of the Roman no. Empire. I'll call it fascismo and it will guide the Italian nation to greatness. That's all well and good, Mr. Mussolini, but what kind of haircut am I giving you? Let's go with... Bold.
Italy had been on the winner's side in World War I, and they hoped they were going to get a lot out of it, but in the end, they only got a little, and they felt cheated. On top of that, a bad economy and weak governments meant that the Italian people were a little unhappy. So when Mussolini came along and said that he could fix everything, his fascist movement gained a lot of support. In 1922, he went to the king and said, make me prime minister, or I'll make me prime minister. And the king said, you and what army? This army. Fair enough. Then he went about establishing a dictatorship with himself at its center. Europe had its first fascist dictator. Next up, Germany. Germany had been on the loser's side and they got absolutely wrecked by the Treaty of Versailles. They lost territory, had to demilitarize the Rhineland, had to reduce their army to just 100,000 men, couldn't have an air force, had to pay the Allies a huge amount of money that it didn't have, and a new rule was established that every Englishman withheld the right to walk into the center of Berlin, pick out any German they wanted, and spank the hell out of them. I made that last one up, but it helps you understand how all this felt to Germans. On top of that, a bad economy and weak governments meant that when a small angry man with a silly mustache came along and said that he could fix everything, the German people loved it. Hitler had been a soldier during World War I, and he was crazy patriotic, and nobody Nobody was madder than him about Germany's humiliation. He helped start a new political party, and in 1923 attended a march on Munich with his boys. And then he got arrested. But his popularity grew and grew, and in 1933, the president made him chancellor. He believed he was Germany's great destined savior, and he went full megalomaniac, establishing a dictatorship with himself at its center. Europe had fascist dictator number two. Hitler and Mussolini had a lot of the same ideas, but more importantly, they had the same enemies, and they started to get along. Anyone else want to be friends? Franco? No? You good? I do. Who's that? It's Japan, and they've taken over northern China. Let's rewind a bit. Japan had isolated itself from the rest of the world for over 200 years until the Americans showed up and said you're gonna trade with us and you're gonna like it. Then the Western powers imposed a bunch of unequal treaties, meaning Japan's economy was bust. They also had no natural resources, so they decided to go get some. They went to war with China to gain a sphere of influence over Korea, and they took a bunch of China's stuff. But then the West said, hey, Cut that out. And since Japan couldn't take on the West, they said, okay, I guess we'll just go home. Wait a minute, what are you doing? Taking advantage of a weakened China and setting up spheres of influence. But I was the one who weakened them. We know. And you guys didn't let me have anything. We know. That seems unfair. We don't think so. Okay, see ya. So Japan thought, screw this, and went to war with Russia, and stunned everyone by actually winning. Then they fully annexed Korea, but they didn't stop there. In World War I, they took Germany's colonies and islands in Asia. And then in an incident that was maybe staged by the Japanese army, a bomb blew up a Japanese train in Manchuria, giving them an excuse to launch an invasion and take over. So here's the situation. Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Japan all believe they're racially superior, all feel hostility towards the Allies, and all want to militarize and take over more stuff. And so they did. Let's start with Germany. Hitler hated the Treaty of Versailles, and now he was ready to begin on doing it. In complete violation of the treaty, the first Luftwaffe squadrons were set up, conscription was introduced, and he pimped up his army. The Allies did nothing. Then Hitler sent his army back into the demilitarized Rhineland, giving orders to immediately retreat if the Allies showed up. The Allies did nothing. With his military re-strengthened, he could now move on to step two. He wanted to rapidly increase the Aryan population, and to do so, he needed Lebensraum. Or in other words, he would have to take over the world. But for now, a good portion of Europe would do, and he began eyeing up his neighbors. The Allies finally started to get worried, so they implemented a fairly useless diplomatic strategy called appeasement, and it went a little something like this. Hitler would say, I want that thing, and the Allies would say, you can't have that thing. Okay, you can have that thing, but no more. I want that thing. And repeat. Want to invest in something refreshing? Bobacino is an automated tea bar that makes and serves. In 1938, Hitler's army marched into Austria and just took it with no resistance. Boom, this is Germany now. Next, he demanded to be given the Sudetenland, an area of Czechoslovakia with many ethnic Germans. The Allies held a meeting with Hitler in Munich and said, Look, we're going to give you what you Hang on. This meeting is about my territory. Shouldn't I come to the meeting too? Anyway, we're going to give you what you want. Really? Yeah. Just like that? Yep. What's the catch? Just sign this piece of paper promising you won't invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay. Then Chamberlain returned home victorious, waving his signed piece of paper in the air, declaring crisis to be averted and the continuation of world peace, and we built a statue of Chamberlain in his honor, and every day on the 30th of September we celebrate Chamberlain Day. Hitler's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. What? He's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. Oh. You lied to me. What do you expect? I'm Hitler. Not to be outdone, Mussolini also wanted to get in on the action. He thought to himself, isn't there a not yet colonized nation somewhere which is so... You know what? I'm done. I'm gonna continue tomorrow. Bye!